Nous sommes euh, très heureux d'accueillir le, le professeur euh, Galbraith pour cette première série euh, de conférences que l'Institut veut organiser autour de la question euh, des, des crises et de l'inégalité. Euh, il nous a paru euh, extrêmement euh, important euh, de lancer ces, ces conférences pour deux raisons. La première raison, c'est que jusque 2010, euh, le narratif de la crise était que la crise ouvrait des fenêtres d'opportunité pour avoir un discours différent, pour euh, réfléchir la place de la finance dans euh, l'économie, l'importance de l'économie réelle, le rôle du social et des amortisseurs sociaux liés à la protection sociale comme moyen euh, d'atténuer euh, la crise, euh, la réflexion sur le changement de modèle productif plus sensible aux questions environnementales. Euh, Jusqu'en 2010, euh, ce fut le, le discours dominant autour de, de la crise. Et depuis euh, 2010, euh, émerge un, un nouveau narratif qui est devenu euh, totalement dominant, c'est que la question de la crise n'est plus la finance, et avant la crise finance, peut-être que le professeur Galbraith va en dire aussi un mot, les inégalités, certainement les inégalités euh, aux États-Unis, euh, mais euh, le problème de la crise est la crise de la dette souveraine, la nécessité en langage populaire de se serrer la ceinture comme on fait dans un ménage, l'État étant comparé à un ménage, et euh, le social est en vue comme non plus une solution, mais un problème dans lequel tant euh, les syndicats doivent être mis sur le côté, la négociation collective doit être décentralisée, les systèmes de pension privatisés, ainsi que l'éducation. Et donc on est tombé dans un, un narratif dominant euh, qui reprend des éléments parfois en les radicalisant du discours avant la crise, il nous a semblé extrêmement important de, de revenir sur ces, ces, ces questions et d'essayer de réinfléchir dans cette période troublée, dans cette période d'incertitude, qui est toute la caractéristique des, des périodes de changement. Les changements ne sont jamais, ou les changements de paradigme ne sont jamais des, des choses euh, simples, de euh, reprendre cette question des, des inégalités pour ceux qui sont intéressés euh, le dernier benchmarking de l'Institut euh, tourne autour des, des inégalités. Mais il y a aussi un, un deuxième thème émergent qui me semble devoir être traité, euh, c'est celui de la question de la divergence. Euh, Quand on a créé euh, la communauté économique européenne et puis l'Union européenne, il y avait une idée sous-jacente qui était une idée forte, c'est qu'on allait vers une convergence, une convergence lente, convergence complexe, mais une convergence dans laquelle les instruments de solidarité, les fonds structurels, le fonds social, le FEDER, les fonds agricoles, allaient contribuer. Et que petit à petit, il y aurait une convergence des niveaux de vie, une convergence des, 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 des niveaux de développement, peut-être aussi une convergence déjà plus complexe, discuter un collègue à vous, Krugman a aussi bien montré les, les divergences qui pouvaient se, se produire en termes de système productif. Or, vous ne pouvez plus aller à une conférence à Bruxelles sans qu'on vous parle de la divergence. Divergence des marchés du travail, divergence des performances des, des pays, divergence des économies réelles, euh, divergence finalement d'une du, Europe qui se divise plutôt euh, qu'elle se réunisse, qui était le projet historique des, des pères fondateurs. Cette divergence peut conduire à euh, ce que j'ai appelé euh, une Europe à, à trois cercles, un cercle autour de l'Allemagne, euh, pas nécessairement géographique, mais un cercle autour de, de, de l'Allemagne en termes productifs, euh, extrêmement productifs, un, un deuxième cercle qui serait en, en langage de producteurs automobiles, les, les fournisseurs de premier ordre, donc les sous-traiteurs de premier ordre, qui se retrouvent en République tchèque, qui se retrouvent en Pologne, qui peuvent se retrouver en Slovaquie. Et puis un, un troisième groupe que j'ai appelé la Nouvelle Chine, qui sont l'ensemble des pays qui, dans quelques années, auront un salaire minimum, 
inférieur à salaire minimum des provinces côtières chinoises, et dans lequel on a là une émergence sur les inégalités, des inégalités potentiellement territoriales dans des zones de spécialisation industrielle euh, extrêmement euh, inquiétantes. Mais je ne suis pas euh, là pour être le speaker principal. <rire> C'est euh, le professeur Galbraith qui euh, a accepté de, de venir, qui fera un premier exposé. Ensuite, nous entendrons euh, trois réactions euh, d'une dizaine de minutes euh, chacune. Euh, Yann Willem Goudrians de l'EPSU nous fera le, le premier euh, qui nous donnera la, la vision euh, syndicale de l'EPSU, mais aussi la vision euh, syndicale par rapport à la question de l'inégalité et la présentation euh, du, du professeur euh, Galbraith. Ensuite, euh, Alfonso Arpaia, qui euh, est à la DG ECFIN, et on sait combien, en tout cas de notre côté, dans d'autres côtés moins, euh, la DG ECFIN a été questionnée sur son rôle, sa vision nous donnera la vision de la DG ECFIN, mais je pense aussi que euh, sa vision parlera aussi à, à titre personnel. Et en, enfin, euh, nous aurons le, le plaisir d'avoir Pierre de Fregne, euh, qui participe à de nombreuses activités euh, de, de l'Institut, euh, qui fera les, les derniers euh, commentaires. So, uh, I will give you uh, the floor for the, your presentation around 40-45 minutes. Thanks again for uh, coming and uh, we are all very interested by your analysis of what is happening in the US and in Europe. Merci, Monsieur le Directeur. Et, uh, je dois dire que c'est pour moi un plaisir d'être ici, un honneur aussi. Et je dois aussi vous féliciter. Vous avez une très belle bibliothèque ici, mm -hmm. avec des livres en anglais, soit en français. That's euh... mine. Uh, the French is mine. The other is for the Dobson. Okay. Uh, I want to speak today about the crisis um, in the perspective of the five years that have passed since, not since it began, but since it became an open um, event, an event to which the world was exposed and to which the world was forced to react. Uh, since they, there is a very strong interest in the relationship between the crisis and economic inequality, I'll begin by just saying a few words about the work uh, that I've done over the years on that subject, on the subject of economic inequality, which is kind of prefatory, but not necessarily in, completely integrated into the study of the crisis itself. Um, The work on inequality goes back to the 1990s, and it uh, involved a great deal of effort to clarify uh, the statistical and therefore also the historical record of what was happening in the world and what uh, relative levels of inequality were, what the evolution of inequality was between and within countries. Uh, and it happened that Uh, I was with a small research group consisting essentially of, of, of uh, PhD students at the University of Texas, able to develop a procedure that made use of very readily available, very inexpensive sources of data to enrich the statistical record in a way which won a great deal of acceptance amongst uh, specialists who were using uh, other sources of data as their primary material up to that point. <laughs> This work in the years before the crisis was actually focused on, I mean, to the extent that it led to policy implications, it was focused on a couple of questions, one of which was exceptionally important in the pre-crisis years in the discussion of, of uh, European policy. And that was the question of what was the relationship between inequality and unemployment, between labor market wage structures and joblessness. And as those of you with extremely long memory and uh, tedious education as economists will probably recall, uh, that there was this uh, a story about uh, flexibilization. Right? Yes, I think that was the word. Uh, the, uh, the idea being that 
the United States experienced uh, a, an enormous success in its labor markets because it allowed the wages of the unskilled to fall and the wages of the skilled to rise, tolerating enormous inequalities, and that this match of the demand for labor with the, uh, uh, with the wage structures enabled us to have much lower unemployment rates than was true in Europe, which was the victim of eurosclerosis, a, uh, uh, an excess of social democracy and trade union power, which was causing chronically high unemployment rates. And a simple question here was, was this true? Was it in fact the case that countries which had less egalitarian wage structures, generally speaking, had less unemployment. Right? And that was something which was extremely hard to assess with the previously existing data, in part because the data themselves were related to household incomes and all kinds of constructs that were not directly related to pay, in part because you couldn't make an appropriate measurement over the uh, appropriate economic unit which was gradually expanding from being individual European countries in the 50s and 60s to being the whole of Europe as the continent became an integrated entity. But we were able to do that work. And what emerged from it was the entirely opposite picture, in fact. That wage structures that were more egalitarian coincided with less unemployment. Wage structures that were more unequal and coincided with more unemployment. And there was a straightforward um, Gra gradient across Europe from north to south in this regard, which everybody knows once you see it, uh, in that the northern European countries experienced much lower unemployment on average over time than the southern European countries did. And why could this be true? Well, a couple of reasons that were actually present in the economic literature suggested themselves to us. One was that inequality fosters migration and search. People in bad jobs like to get better jobs, and the differential is larger if you're more unequal. And therefore, you would expect people hunting for small numbers of good jobs to be quite numerous in a country which has quite, quite unequal. But people in a country which is very egalitarian, this is less going to be less of an issue. People are going to stay put. So that's the difference between, let's say, Norway and Spain. Uh, and a second reason is that, in particular, countries which hold their wage structures relatively compressed over time, experienced more rapid rates of productivity growth over long periods of time, rising living standards, and were therefore able to absorb their unemployed in civil service jobs or the service sector, and that even while maintaining an open trading uh, posture, which is again uh, had its expression in the literature in the Ren Meidner or LO model, which motivated the uh, Scandinavian experience for quite a few decades. So we suggested long before the crisis that, in fact, the study of inequality provided a very interesting way of assessing what had become a common wisdom. My father's phrase, the conventional wisdom, comes to mind, but I try not to use it too often. Um, the, uh, and showing that there was, in fact, that it didn't work out. Uh, and indeed, it also appeared, and this may be a surprise to a European audience, that when one accounted for the differences in wages between countries, the common perception that the US was much more unequal in wage structures than Europe was also uh, not necessarily true, because the vast differences between Germany and Poland or between, uh, let's say, Norway and Portugal, when you factored them in, that raises the overall level of European wage inequality compared to the US case where everything is measured inside a single uh, state. So that was one area where we made a contribution. And the second one was in the relationship between inequality and finance, not necessarily in the context of crises, but just in general, we discovered looking at a great many cases, including the United States, but not exclusively, it was also true of Russia, China, and other countries that we looked at, that uh, as uh, the financial sector became increasingly dominant, so too inequality went up. And the movement of inequality over time is very closely related to credit cycles and to the valuation of capital assets. And in fact, when you make some adjustments for changes in the measurement in the United States, the match between inequality of incomes, which includes capital gains, stock options, realizations, and things of that nature, incomes derived from firms that are raising their money through venture capital and not by sales, 
those measures are very closely related to the movement of the stock market, causing me to argue that you really needed, didn't need to measure inequality in the United States. You could simply read it in the morning paper or just turn on the television and watch it go by on the ticker. Uh, the, uh, um, but these two things were part of the backdrop of the study that ultimately led to the other book that the director has, which is Inequality and Instability, uh, a book which appeared after the crisis. Uh, so the crisis then happens. Uh, and we are now five years later. Uh, and it is, it seems to me, a good time to cast our eyes back over this event and ask, what have been the uh, predominant explanations to which we have been exposed? Uh, and what can we think of them in light of the experience sense? The experience sense has to be, in view of most of the explanations that we've heard, exceptionally disappointing. Why? Because most of the explanations are consistent with the view that the crisis was a transient event from which recovery would proceed more or less on its own. That was a view that was built in to the structure of economic thinking, I think both in the United States and Europe, certainly built into official forecasting models uh, in the United States. If you looked at them in the early 2009, when GDP was falling at 8 or 10 percent at an annual rate, they expected a full recovery to have occurred by the end of 2012 or early 2013. And guess what? It has not. Right. What were the underlying um, conceptual foundations of that expectation. Well, there was a notion which was also associated with labor market adjustment called the natural rate of unemployment. I, those of you, again, with long and tedious ex educations in economic, economics may remember this phrase. Um, it hasn't, I think, been heard very much in the last five years, but there it is. It's right there in the literature. You can go back to Milton Friedman in 1968, and the idea was that labor markets adjust after shocks by adjustment of real wages to restore employment levels, substitution of labor for capital. None of this has, of course, occurred. And then there was a, a kind of statistical explanation, the so-called black swan theory, which held that this was just a rare event, a freak of nature. But if freaks of nature happen, then nature should repair itself over time. Nature does not seem to have done so. The question is, why is that the case? There was a story that the crisis was essentially a phenomenon of fear, the so-called liquidity trap story. My colleague Paul Krugman uh, made, a, I mean, there's some truth to this, of course. It would rush into very liquid, very safe assets and out of real activity. But then you have to raise the question of why five years later isn't there a uh, basically a movement back into um, the uh, normal run or the previously normal run of economic activity. Has something, in other words, happened on a permanent basis that we have not been um, really taken into account? I want to mention uh, there are a great many of, um, uh, of these sort of what I'll, we'll call one-note narratives, um, shocks, backslons, liquidity traps, and other things that one could talk about that have appeared in uh, a lot of books written quite hastily since the crisis. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of others uh, which have particular significance uh, for our discussions today. Uh, one of them is the, uh, uh, the argument that inequality is itself the cause of the crisis. And this is an argument which has been made by uh, Raghuram Rajan. Uh, a financial economist at the University of Chicago who does have the very important merit of having been in 2005, I think, at the uh, uh, famous, or I should say infamous, Jackson Hole conferences, uh, uh, which are celebrations of the great intellect and wisdom and infallibility of, uh, of the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, something which would, uh, it, on a scale that would embarrass the modern Vatican. Um, but. Uh, Rajan uh, did have the merit of issuing, uh, making a paper w in very delicate terms asking the question whether the um, marvelous technological innovations of the financial sector might just be contributing a little bit to the riskiness of the world. And this was greeted uh, in that uh, serene and beautiful setting by the functional equivalent of people reacting to farting in church. Excuse me. Yeah. As we would say, I, we would say, excuse my French, but I actually said that in English. Um, in any event, 
Rajan has come out with a, uh, a book which, which he, he says that what happened in the United States was fundamentally due to the rise of inequality. The rise of inequality which created a gap in consumption standards between the wealthy and the middle class, causing the middle class to, um, in effect, have a, um, a fit of uh, relative deprivation, uh, which they met because they couldn't uh, meet it by their, uh, from their incomes, which they met by going out and borrowing. So you have the image of the vast American suburban dweller, uh, the vast millions of American suburban dwellers going out and buying bigger boats. Uh, or larger cars, SUVs, uh, in order to uh, keep up with what they imagine to be the living standards of the dwellers of the South Hampton, of the Hamptons, and uh, other uh, exclusive enclaves, Boca Raton, and so forth. Uh, and I guess my answer to that is, as a student of inequality, I don't think so. I don't think so because, precisely because, in the work that I've done uh, and was doing before the crisis, what became clear was that the rise of the financial sector and financial sector incomes and inequality were not distinct events. One did not precede the other. They were, in fact, one and the same thing. Uh, in the income tax data, inequality goes up because the incomes of a small number of very wealthy people go up. And you can see that they are people who are reporting their incomes from New York, New York, Manhattan. Uh, and from a handful of places in California, uh, Silicon Valley, and a pl one place in Washington State, which is Seattle. I mean, you can guess whose income tax is filed there. We can even know his name. Uh, okay, uh, so that's part of the problem, but the other part of the problem is that that story doesn't correspond at all to what we know from many detailed journalistic accounts of how the crisis actually happened. How the crisis actually happened was through the vast origination of mortgages, mortgages which were then converted into mortgage-backed securities, mortgages which were known by the lenders at the time they were made to be unpayable. All right? Mortgages that were set up in such a way that they would have to be refinanced or default. And this was known to a great many people, and if you want the authoritative word on it, I recommend the book that's just been published by Sheila Baer, who was the chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in a position to know. And this is what she says explicitly. And she, by the way, is a Republican and an appointee of George W. Bush. Her credibility on the matter is beyond um, impeachability. It is perfectly straightforward. And she, of course, she's telling the truth. But it's worse than that. Mortgages of two types were very common in this picture. One of them was mortgages made to very low-income people, often minorities, let's say African-American homeowning residents of relatively of very modest neighborhoods in places like Cleveland, and there's a book on this too, uh, where the loan would be for $5,000 to repair a roof or some plumbing, and it would be refinanced six times in eight months, and it would end up being a $20,000 debt of which the recipient had only seen, ever seen $5,000 and the roof would never get repaired and the recipient would be foreclosed upon. This was intentional, uh, let's say, looting of vulnerable and low-income people. And a second type was uh, very prevalent in places like Florida and Nevada uh, and it consisted of mortgages made on the construction, on the sale of newly built houses to people who didn't have enough money to move into them. And so the houses were never occupied and the mortgages defaulted on the first payment. And the knowledge that that was going on was how people like the heroes of Michael Lewis's book, The Big Short, made a half a billion dollars, 550 million in one case, shorting the mortgage-backed securities that were sold. Okay, that were sold. They were sold on the basis of uh, a laundering operation carried out by the ratings agency that classed them AAA, just as good as US government debt. And sold to whom? As uh, there's a conversation in Michael Lewis's book about this, to investment bankers. One of them says to the other, "So who's buying this stuff anyway?" And the answer comes back: Dusseldorf. Dusseldorf. Okay. Both a literal and a figurative statement. Okay. They were sold to people who were distant, who trusted the ratings agencies, and who trusted the banks that they were dealing with, quite wrongly. And that raises the question which Rajan never raises, which is another 
but considerably more powerful if you want a single note narrative of this thing, which is the narrative of financial fraud. A vast amount of it, a vast amount of it, which has been allowed to fester because the criminal prosecution authorities in the United States haven't done their job in the last five years. They often say at home, well, if only Attorney General Holder were alive. Sad to say, but the Justice Department has been asleep and quite deliberately so. The same, however, is not entirely true of other federal agencies and private plaintiffs. And if you read the New York Times yesterday, you will note that the total exposure, ex estimated exposure in civil fraud claims now underway from the Federal Housing Finance Authority and the FDIC and a lot of private plaintiffs, but I think probably not enough Europeans. I just dropped that hint in case there's a lawyer in the audience who would like to make a living over the next few years. It's about $300 billion, which in the context even of the United States banking system is still quite a substantial sum of money. So there's a series of stories that we can tell. I think they're all basically inadequate. Though I do think the fraud story has an enormous amount of substance which needs to be taken on board and I dwell on it because in the five years that we've been discussing this issue, this is the one that gets discussed the least. Nobody denies it, but people do not wish to face it because it lacks an element of politeness. Uh, that is customary in discussions of this type. If we were going to come to a full understanding of this though, we have to ask ourselves, why did this happen? How can the financial sector in the United States collapse in the way it did with a desupervision, deregulation and desupervision that permits it to be taken over by the most aggressive kind of hucksters? This is not something that happens on its own. It happened in part because the authorities permitted and encouraged it to happen. Why did they do that? I think the answer for that goes back 40 years. It goes back to the 1970s and the oil crises, which were temporarily placed in remission by the enormous financial power of the United States exercised during the debt crisis of the 1980s, which suppressed growth in much of the rest of the world, and by the fact that we were able to use that financial power to supply ourselves and you with resources over the next two decades at fairly low prices. And that came to an end in the 2000s. And when resource costs go up, then there is, that's a cost to businesses, particularly in the importing countries, there's a profit squeeze. It's not possible to continue to uh, report results on the same foundation as before unless you have some other basis for doing so. Okay, so that's explanation number one. Now I said say fundamental fact number one that lies in the background of these events. An important fact number two lies I think also in the nature of the technological changes that we experienced at the same time. Technological changes which have been f fundamentally labor saving. That is to say, they have moved very strongly against the cost of labor in the developed countries. As anybody who employs journalists or any other form of, uh, of, of office work knows that, uh, that there are, there's vast and, and continuing potential for substitution by electronic technology uh, of the previously uh, human technology, well, substitution and outsourcing which has weakened the labor basis of uh, societies, of the advanced societies especially, not so much of developing countries. Uh, I, I, is doing an effect to the office worker and certainly to the journalist and maybe eventually to the college professor what the internal combustion engine a, year, a century ago did to the horse, uh, rendering them redundant. Uh, and when you put those two things together and you have a, uh, um, a cycle in technological developments, which in our case peaked in 2000 and afterwards, I mean, it's when the, when the boom in creation of these technologies peaked, and afterwards it's simply a diffusion matter and there's more and more pressure on uh, jobs, there's more and more pressure on incomes, more and more pressure on the tax bases of uh, advanced countries, and particularly of states and localities in the United States and countries in Europe. And that is made up for by a series of devices which are mainly in the fraudulent extension of credit in the United States. Cooking the books, in other words, by recording incomes which are of a transitory nature, 
that will be undone when the real underlying basis of the credit instruments is exposed to be uh, crumble. And to some extent this goes on in Europe, except that the forms are different. In Europe, you have lending to the public sector in Greece for the Olympics and a lot of other construction, not to mention the, uh, um, the Greek military budget. You have lending to, uh, uh, for housing and residential construction in Spain. You have lending for commercial real estate development in uh, Ireland. You have, uh, the, of course, all the, uh, the banking activity in Iceland. Very much the same sort of story, but on a different institutional foundation and a different uh, uh, set of creditor-debtor. Uh, relations that are much more institutional and much less, let's say, oriented toward individuals. But when the crisis happens, it basically happens to everybody at once and for a reason. And I say it this way because it seems to me extremely important to recognize that what one has beginning in 2007 and culminating in 2009 uh, and moving on from there is a single world crisis. Of, a, in, of an integrated financial system, a flight to safety by investors who know they're going to take big losses on their American assets and therefore dump the weak European sovereigns as a result of that. And it wasn't, though, as suddenly discovered that Greece has a bloated public service and a weak tax base. I mean, this was not a fact that was completely unknown to anybody who had basically been there for even a short period of time. But in the nature of financial crisis, you have uh, enthusiastic extension of loan to weak borrowers, uh, and then a complete retraction uh, on a common basis after that goes away. I think there was in this a complete failure on the part also of progressive economists to understand uh, what they were up against, or perhaps a willful desire to um, uh, be useful that required them to suppress an understanding of the extent of the turning point that we were at and the extent of the institutional and structural underpinnings of this disaster. So what did we get from the progressive economist community? We got the revival of Keynes. Okay? We got the reassertion of the Keynesian solution. Some of it in very good faith by people I, I really truly love and respect and others, in other cases, by people who I think uh, could be reasonably qualified as false Keynesians or phony Keynesians, uh, Keynesians of convenience in the immediate period, who basically thought, well, we'll do a little stimulus, and that will speed up the normal processes of recovery, right? As though a fundamental breakdown in the structure of the core institutions that motivate and maintain economic growth can be repaired by public spending alone. Right? And the public spending, of course, did have some stabilizing effects. But so long as you make this into a temporary and, uh, uh, and scaled phenomenon that's intended only to support an underlying process of recovery, you're not going to achieve it. It is the same problem that you have if you have uh, if you fail to put water in the radiator of your car, and then you discover you melted down the transmission. Uh, you cannot repair this just by adding gas to the tank, right? And one can do nuclear reactor. In fact, it's a mechanical, universal mechanical metaphor that applies here. There is a difference between fueling uh, or giving stimulus and injection to an or to an otherwise healthy patient who just needs caffeine to get them going again, or amphetamine, whatever it might be, uh, and a medical intervention that to deal with, a f with organ failure, which is something else entirely, and is something that's going to give you a much longer and more troubled recovery period. And the point that I'm making is that we are in that phenomenon now. The fact, unfortunately, that the banner of Keynesianism was seized by people who had this very short-term, let's say, post-war American MIT-based uh, view of the Keynesian po policy, a kind of hydraulic Keynesianism, it used to be called, uh, in, uh, back in the 1970s, or Joan Robinson's phrase was bastard Keynesianism, um, created an enormous problem for progressives trying to inject themselves into uh, this conversation because 
it led to, again, overpromising and disappointment, and therefore a loss of credibility on the part of the whole progressive side of the ledger. Uh, <clears throat> This began to be encountered quite early in the US uh, with uh, a whole wave of what we'll call New Deal revisionism. Um, one example of which was quite funny, I found myself invited to a meeting at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, organized by one Amity Schles, uh, and who had done a day on why and how Franklin Roosevelt had managed to prolong the Great Depression, which would otherwise have surely been over by 1936, had he done nothing and not done the New Deal. And this was, by the, even by the standards of modern New York, uh, so far beyond the pale of intellectual respectability that someone finally tapped Ms. Schles on the shoulder and said, you need some balance on that panel. And so my cell phone rang uh, one day and I was <laughs> invited. And I thought, you know, the world is really strange when I'm being invited to lend respectability to the Council on Foreign Relations. <laughs> anyway, that's so part of the, of, of the process of creating what I'll call uh, the new crack pottery uh, as a dominant intellectual tradition, uh, which is the view that uh, basically government needs to get out of the way and the problem is excessive scale of government, excessive scale of social welfare programs, uh, excessive intervention in the labor markets once again, uh, and that the solution is austerity uh, and the return of confidence. Uh, and that is, of course, a common theme uh, in both Europe and the United States. It's a theme which gives us the fiscal cliff coming up in just a few weeks, although its effects will be, I think, mitigated to a very substantial extent, whatever happens. But it gives you the notion that uh, austerity and reductions and the Troika's policies for Greece are somehow going to restore investor confidence in the sovereign credit markets uh, that will fuel a recovery of the European Union. And at this point, I cannot imagine that it is possible for any sane person to believe this. I cannot imagine it. Because if it were true, it would have happened long ago. But as a point of logic, it cannot be true. Why not? Obviously, we're dealing with a single unified, interacting world investment community. And not just the primary instruments, but also the derivative instruments, the credit default swaps, uh, which are essentially the negative of the cash flows associated with the underlying bonds. And they can be bought and sold in the same way and the prices all have to move. And if you are, no matter what country, no matter how obedient to the diktat of the Troika, you're going to find that a piece of bad news emanating from anywhere else in the world is going to move people out of this whole class of assets at the same time. You cannot rescue yourself by individual action under these circumstances. And so what happens is the Keynesian dynamic, which kicks in, not that austerity leads to a decline in GDP, this is an obvious fact, Greece six years in, uh, five years in a row of 6% per, the decline in GDP leads to a decline in tax revenues. You end up with the same deficit you had before, a higher debt to GDP ratio because GDP is down, and your public institutions, which were not strong to begin with, education, healthcare, transportation, whatever else you need, are weaker, so you're no longer attractive to investment either. This is a formula which is going to lead, it leads to divergence, you mentioned it, is going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to destruction. And I've been saying this, that there is, when you think about the way this goes, and when you link it to the news that we're getting today uh, about what's happening on the periphery, what's called the periphery of Europe, but in many ways is the heart of Europe, uh, then you have to recognize there, this is not something that we're unfamiliar with. This is something we have seen before, not long ago, not far away. Yugoslavia was, a, in its day, a very successful middle-income country. Right? It was a country which was a model that economists of my generation went to study of cooperative worker management relations and um, stable middle-class development. And we know what happens when a country breaks, an advanced country breaks apart 
under the stresses of, among other things, international debt that can't be paid and can't be gotten rid of. Okay? Things can go very quickly into a direction that nobody would ever want to see again. Right? I just say it's out there. You don't, can't say when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. But that model is there and it's not something to be walled off as some historically uh, strange artifact of, our, of another time and another system. So what's there? What do we know, I'll, and then I'll wrap up and let people react. What do we know as principles are appropriate ways of dealing with this crisis? I believe that given what I said about the underlying structural foundations, that the notion of going to have a rapid return of growth is a fantasy no matter who is offering it, including if it were being offered by me. And so I'm not offering it. I'm offering a thought that we need to condition ourselves to the idea that the best we can hope for if we do things right is a slower rate of growth and a lower rate of profit. Right? And then we need to make our societies work on that basis until something better comes along. Right? How do we do that? We need, first of all, stabilizing institutions that work over the appropriate populations. Right? I was at the conference, Congress of IG Metal uh, in Berlin a couple of days ago, uh, and a colleague, a sociologist from the UK, suggested a European unemployment insurance scheme. Okay? Not a bad idea. I suggested, in addition to that, a European pension union, a supplement for the low-income countries. So get incomes into the hands of people who would use them in situ, employing unemployed resources where they presently are, and stabilizing the incomes of the, some of the poorest people in the zone. Um, what you could do a number of things beyond that, but the basic principle here is that an integrated economy needs stabilizing revenue flows. Right? And that is something which the U.S., for all of the faults of our system, developed in the 1930s through the 1960s with Social Security, with Medicare, with Medicaid, with a continental minimum wage, with uh, federally funded insurance, and by the way, with a single national military budget. We do not ask the people of Alabama to pay for the privilege of uh, birthing an aircraft carrier there. Right? Right? Even though it might not be produced, well, it may be produced there. If it's birthed in San Diego, we don't ask the San Diegans to pay for it, right? The way you ask the Greeks to pay for the privilege of buying submarines and tanks from other countries. This is just not a, a, an arrangement which is going to work for the long run. And so it should be changed. That seems to me the first principle. Solidarity is not just a principle of compassion. It's a stabilizing principle and it has to be applied over the whole spectrum where you have a problem. And the other thing, once you've got that in place, then you can start thinking about strategic management. That is to say, figuring out what the principal objectives that you need to be pursuing as a community actually are. And then, of course, we come back to energy, we come to climate change, we come to the big challenges that we actually face, and those need to be dealt with in a competent way. But, of course, they may not be dealt with in any event. They certainly won't be dealt with in the context of a continuing and deepening crisis which absorbs everybody's attention and preoccupies everybody with the basics of trying to provide a, say, personal solutions uh, or uh, some alternative politics to the one that's out there. Uh, I don't think there are good alternatives to, the, um, to a transformation of the European structures. Uh, but that doesn't mean there are, aren't alternatives. There certainly are. And you can contemplate them for a while, and then you come back to the basic problem of trying to figure it out as a community. Thanks very much. Appreciate the time. Good luck. <laughs>